Good afternoon. Hello. We have, we have some announcements. We have uh, breakout sessions and a poster session coming up this afternoon. Uh, and the community support volunteers for the afternoon are uh, Sujong Herring and uh, Sharon Clapp. Uh, one additional uh, announcement, Sharon has lost her phone, uh, so Sujong is the only volunteer at the moment. Uh, Sharon's trying to find her phone. If you find a uh, Samsung S10, um, black and silver, uh, it might be Sharon's. So please, I guess, return it to uh, the uh, registration desk. Gosh, S10, not much. <laughs> uh, Let's see, uh, what else we got here? Uh, community sort volunteers, uh, Dana Dramada Yelton and Beth Sadler from three to five. And they're all located in the back of the room and have zebra striped lanyards. Uh, the online community support volunteer is Eric Petterplace, uh, P-H-E-T-T-E -T -T -E 23 on Slack uh, from one to three. And then Mike Giarlo, uh, MJ Giarlo on Slack from three to 5 p.m. And then uh, we got talks starting in about t 10 minutes. So stick around. What would you like to see? Do you know any tricks? That's my stress management. <laughs> and whenever I have spare time, I heal you. So that's why I carry it with me. I recommend getting some habit that you can do instead of surfing the internet. Because, <laughs> you know, running a compile, build, sure, uh, running a compile, building a, uh, a Docker container, or whatever, you're going to be sitting around a while. So get a yo yo, get a harmonica, do something to keep your hands busy. You still can't hear me. Wow. This is, okay. How about how about now? No. How about now? Oh, that's right. I got to talk over the background noise. Well, I'm not saying much important. So. Any requests? Around the world, thank you.
We can start? Yeah. Oh, okay. I've been, give per, per, been given permission to start. So we have uh, in group six talks, um, uh, the first person up is uh, Vicky uh, Karasek. Oh, thank you. What's that? Like, oh, Jurassic. Vicky Jurassic. Karasek. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, Robert Anthony Lee uh, Faison. Uh, our path to development, creating an uh, organizational safety net to tackle imposter syndrome among developers. Come on up. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me OK? All right. Thank you for coming to our talk entitled Our Path to Development, Creating an Organizational Safety Net to Tackle Imposter Syndrome Among Developers. Uh, my name is Vicki Karasik. This is my colleague, Robert Lee Faison. Um, we're from Princeton University Library. This is our first time at Code for Lib. Um, and <laughs> thank you. And ooh, we will introduce ourselves more in just a minute. Um, so today, our talk will include the following. We'll introduce ourselves and our paths to how we got to our current roles doing development work in libraries. Um, we'll talk about imposter syndrome as a concept and provide a definition of what it means to us as new developers from non-traditional paths. And we'll talk about ways we've been tackling it with the help of our organization and our colleagues. Um, we'll then move on to talk about some development strategies and projects that we've been using to learn and grow in our everyday work, again, with the help of our wonderful colleagues. Um, and then we will share some final thoughts about our experiences and some recommendations for how hopefully other organizations can help new developers um, tackle feelings of imposter syndrome. And we'll be using QR codes throughout our presentation um, for some resources we want to link you to. So this first one is just a link to our slides. So feel free to scan it and follow along. And they're also up on the OSF platform as well. All right. So we will um, talk about ourselves and the paths we took to get to our current positions. Um, as for me, I come from a pretty traditional humanities background. Um, in college, I could often be found geeking out about 19th century French literature. Um, as a first generation college student, I didn't really know that computer science was a major, um, let alone a field. And um, even in graduate school, I certainly didn't have um, development, application development on my radar. Um, so when I went to library school, I took a pretty traditional subject specialist path because of my background. Um, but I started working in educational technology and really just fell in love with helping um, students and faculty incorporate tech into teaching and learning. And that really shaped my path. Um, when I was doing that work, I would often hit blockers and get frustrated when a faculty member would come to me and ask for a custom plugin to be made or you know, customizing the user interface of a, a website. And aside from kind of basic HTML skills, that was really where my, um, my skill level dropped off and I would have to pass that work to developers. And that was frustrating because I really wanted to learn those skills but just didn't have the chance on the job. And so the unicorn for me uh, was finding a position that would let me learn application development on the job. And so here I am at Princeton. Um, so as the library IT operations systems administrator, um, I maintain and update our production applications and their corresponding staging environments. I do a lot of application training, so workshops, one-on-one -on -one consultations, writing user documentation, administering user accounts, that kind of thing. And because um, some of the applications I manage are locally hosted, I've been learning a lot about server administration and our virtual infrastructure. Um, and I will talk more about all that in a few minutes with our project section. But for now, I want to turn it over to Robert so that he can talk about his path. All right. Can everyone hear me? Back up a little bit. OK, OK. I don't have to lean in. You can still hear me? You can hear me? OK. One more time for first time presenters. 
Okay. All right. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, a little bit about my background, I'll be brief, because I don't want to stray too far from what we're up here to actually talk about. Um, but a little bit about me. I've always been surrounded by technology and the organization and management of information. Whether it was organizing a crudely made playlist, um, carefully and methodically selecting cover art and editing the track names for it, my iPod, or um, being asked to power the equipment that my hometown church invested in, that allow for text and images to be projected um, for the congregation or services, technology has always been a part of my life. Um, from the first year computer, my family had set up in the living room. Um, who here remembers AOL dial-up? Okay, 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 cool, cool. <laughs> and uh, witnessing my parents switch from their older, um, clunky, clunkier um, block phones to Blackberries and iPhones, um, they do keep these devices, by the way, in their closets now, so it's kind of like their own museum that they have <laughs> in the closet. <laughs> uh, I thank them for embracing um, nascent technology, which contributes to my own interest in it. Um, this has inspired me to pursue an educational background and learning how technology is woven throughout our lives, not only in understanding devices at a top level, but being able to share this knowledge with my community and inspiring others to um, continuously enrich themselves is what compels me to, um, to dispel the effects of imposter syndrome and to continue to show up for myself and be the best version of myself. Um, it was during my graduate studies that I came across this program whose mission was to help bridge the technological divide for underrepresented groups. Part of what I wanted to do or part of what I want to do in my um, profession is to help enable people to embrace technology and to help them access the information as I do. Um, from this, I developed a personal goal to become a proponent, even past this program, um, with this knowledge that I gained from it to um, help experience or help to share my knowledge and experiences with others. And let's see. Okay, cool. Since joining the Princeton community as a library operations IT fellow, um, these are just some of the skills that I've gained knowledge in. Um, project management, um, physical, virtual, um, server maintenance, um, full stack development. Um, and with these skills, uh, these experiences, they can never be taken away. The Princeton community has been teaching me how to navigate or move in these spaces as not only a technologist or developer, but as a better professional overall. Um, as we're learning in our new positions, we're defining ourselves as developers in the following ways. We write and review code and pair with other professionals on solutions. Pairing for us means that senior and non-senior developers are coding together on, on one computer or a shared screen. Uh, the PUL community, or Princeton University Library community, has been integral towards molding not just a good developer, but it also helps mitigate the feelings of not belonging and these subconscious irrational fears of being exposed as lesser. Okay, now back to the topic. Imposter syndrome, what does it mean? Here we have a definition, um, I think one of two, I believe, in this presentation. Uh, imposter syndrome is the feeling that you aren't actually qualified for the work you are doing and will be discovered as a fraud. Um, a little context, at least are, are from personal experience. Um, I would often find myself in rooms where I was sort of plagued with these um, emotions or feelings of, of not feeling like I was enough or you know that I didn't deserve to be in these rooms. You know, questions of belonging, questions of my own self-doubts and fears continuously building up. Um, and at times it deterred me from pursuing um, opportunities. Um, Overanalyzing would have lead me to believe that I did not belong in those rooms at all, as I just mentioned. Um, and this is before I even knew what imposter syndrome was. Okay, so another definition slash Q and A, so to so to speak. Um, so, what does imposter syndrome mean to us? To analyze this question, we must take a step back and view things from a broader sense. To look outside of our own attributes as newer professionals, um, people of color, um, women, um, neurodivergency, 
Um, we view these as ver barriers of entry of not belonging to an organization, which can be detrimental. We began to view ourselves as fraudulent and develop this fear of not belonging. This could lead to feelings of withdrawing from those who support your endeavors. Uh, stress and tension could build up, which could lead to inefficiency and less productivity and damage your relationships with those who are trying to help you. Not good. Okay, so um, to just sort of, I'm sure by now you've all read this um, excerpt here, but when are we going to stop signaling that fear and anxiety is normal within our profession and instead examine how these narratives are the result of institutions deflecting the need for change? This is by Nicola Andrews. Um, the answer to this, or expanding on our answer to this, is that our organization is helping us to overcome these barriers by building internal structures that have provided a safety net for us to learn and grow as part of our everyday jobs through ways that Vicki introduced us to now. So yeah, as Robert said, uh, ways that our organization promotes the structures and environments, we need to learn and grow and overcome these feelings of imposter syndrome. We do a lot of pairing with senior developers, so this often means that we are in the driver's seat. They are riding shotgun, ready to help us as we go along. And as non-senior developers, we also work together a lot and fill in each other's knowledge gaps and teach each other. It's been a great way to learn. Um, we also are encouraged to get as much access to our systems as possible. So for example, our virtual infrastructure, um, we are encouraged to experiment and break things if that means we are learning. Um, we're also encouraged to ask a lot of questions, so both in meetings and on projects. And as a woman in technology, I often don't feel comfortable asking a lot of questions if I don't know enough about a topic, but this has been quite the opposite um, on our team and in our organization. We're encouraged to just ask questions, big or small, and no matter the skill level where we are. And we just are encouraged to get our hands dirty. So Robert and I have been working a lot with Git and GitHub. Um, this is a conversation I had a couple months ago with my colleague Alicia. I thought I did something terribly wrong and deleted a bunch of commits on a branch as I was trying to do something else. And I asked her to pair with me. I expected her to be worried. And she said, that's great news. Congratulations. It means you're really working with Git. And that was a really, um, <laughs> that was a really, great point of inflection for me where I kind of overcame some of that initial frustration and said, okay, I can actually do this and there are people who are going to help me. And so um, another way our institution helps us tackle feelings of imposter syndrome is that we have a really strong DevOps culture. Um, so things like team empowerment, cross-team communication and collaboration. Um, this is a picture of our colleague Tyler who gave a fantastic presentation yesterday. And <laughs> yay. <laughs> And uh, this was us at a lunch last summer at all, our um, All Hands Week. So we had some good timing of a few of us all starting at the same time last summer in IT, and it made, it's made for really great um, a cohort feel and group learning. Um, there's also been explicit organizational structure around mentorship. So there are positions of senior developers and more junior developers meant to kind of coach and guide each other. And there's this um, sense that we're growing and in, into our new roles. We don't have all the skills we're going to need right now. Um, there's always new skills to learn. So we're just continuously learning and working on it together. And again, working and learning across teams. There's probably not a day where I don't work with someone on a different team, either within IT or in the library. Um, so we kind of have a great sense of shared goals and moving forward that way. So now uh, we'll talk about some strategies and concrete examples of projects we've been working on to get us more comfortable uh, learning development principles and how we've been applying these to our own work. So our first strategy is find others at your level. So find a colleague or a peer um, who has the same or similar skill level with you and just learn with them and lean on them while you're learning. So an example of this is our command line curriculum that Robert and I have been working through. This was uh, developed by our colleague Francis Cayua uh, for a regional Code for Lib meeting several years ago. And it's a living uh, repo that were those new to the command line are working through. And this is the QR code to the repo. Uh, for example, Robert and I took a deep dive early on into Vim. And um, now that we're managing uh, locally hosted applications, um, we are using that and relying on each other. We have two minutes left, so I am going to breeze through this. Um, finding mentors, people you feel comfortable working with. Um, one example of that is we have a repository called Ops Catchall, where we, and Ops the Hard Way, where we work on projects uh, manually before turning to automation. So that's been a really great way to learn. 
And we do lots of pairing and ensembling work. So um, whether this is in a small group or large groups, an example of this is our Princeton Ansible repository. Um, we have open Ansible, open Ansible hours, Ansible open hours um, every week where folks from IT come together and we um, merge pull requests and press the big green button and, um, and work together. I'll turn it over to Robert for the last few strategies. All right, thanks, Vicki. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to breeze through these uh, next couple of strategies here. Um, so as you can see, next one is tackle small, easy fixes. Uh, let's see, example of this, we had within our um, community here, we had what were called good first issue tickets. Um, these were tickets that, you know, minor um, bug fixes and um, small feature implementations to pre-existing applications within our org. Um, as a way for, again, for newer developers to pair with more senior developers and just sort of strategize and um, develop the scaffolding of, of how to, you know, do it the DevOps way. Uh, next one is building the institutional culture. The example we have here is the Learn to Program um, Ruby Book Club. Please scan this QR code right now, everyone. Um, some of you most likely already have this book. It's by Chris Pond, um, Learn to Program. It's an amazing book. Um, but we meet um, about an hour um, out of the week, and we do just that. We pair and we learn Ruby. Uh, we have different modules, different exercises, and it's cool to um, just reinforce the idea that um, coding can be artisanal. There is no one way or one correct way to solve a problem. So that's been awesome. Um, next one is take formal training when you can. So um, the Princeton community, um, they allowed Vicky and I the opportunity to attend this one week Red Hat training. And it was just going over the, uh, uh, the concepts or the um, basics of systems administration. Um, it was a week long course and it was a way for Vicky and I to um, collaborate more closely and just sort of share and trade um, ideas and introduce ideas to each other. And so that was that was pretty cool. All right, so now we have some uh, takeaways and recommendations, which I will pass it back to Vicki. All right, I am seeing that we are out of time. So we'll just leave this up here. Big takeaway is that it is our job to be developers, to learn and grow as we work. And our organization supports this in really concrete and tangible ways. Um, our colleagues are fabulous and take a lot of time out of their days to do this. And it really has helped us um, overcome institutional barriers that can lead to imposter syndrome, um, especially among new developers or those from non-traditional paths. These are some recommendations. Be your own advocate. Find a buddy, learn with them, find a mentor. Um, and even these small steps can really help um, change organizational culture. So thank you to everybody at Princeton University Library. There were too many faces to put on this slide. We wouldn't have enough room. Um, so thank you to everybody who helped us with this presentation. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thanks. So, mouse is over there. Here we go. Uh, we have a recorded talk next uh, from uh, David Sorella. Oh, sorry. We have a report recorded talk next uh, by David Sorella. Uh, there's going to be some changes developing support, uh, supporting developers, and supporting development. And I believe I don't have to do anything at all. I just step away from the microphone.
Hello, my name is David Sorello. I'm a digital preservation librarian at Yale University Library. And I'd like to thank the Code for Lib community for having me today to present. There's going to be some changes, developing support, supporting developers, and supporting development. This is a talk about our experience and lessons learned working through upgrade related changes. At Yale Library, the Digital Preservation Services Unit that includes myself and three other staff members provide services to the university libraries, special collections, archives, museums, galleries, and the law library. Our primary responsibility is providing support to staff users of our digital preservation system, which since late 2015 uh, has been the Preservica digital preservation system. We currently hold over one petabyte of unique data comprised of more than 127 million files, that have been brought into the system through over 800,000 ingest workflows. And much of the scale has been achieved through a number of different custom software integrations that automate the packaging and ingest processes. Preservica is a commercial off-the-shelf software package that provides functionality and tools for carrying out a pretty standard set of digital preservation tasks, which are listed here in the blue box. And as a closed source system, uh, we don't serve any role in the development of this core functionality. But here on the edges, we have two areas of functionality where we ourselves and other parts of the library, other units that we work with, either have developers or have contracted development of custom software to automate tasks in packaging data, managing ingest flow, and providing access to held assets. In early 2020, we began planning for a major upgrade to the Preservic application that had been described by the vendor as next generation and re-engineered from the ground up. Now we're looking forward to having access to and, and utilizing some new features, some new upgrades, um, but we knew going into it that there would be extensive changes involved. And we quickly found that this upgrade would affect most of the existing custom software integrations that we had in place. Looking at the changes, there are complete deprecation of an in-application SDK uh, that had enabled running custom uh, software code on the application server, interacting with the application directly. There's a deprecation of the primary user-facing desktop and command line packaging tools provided by the vendor. And these are being deprecated in favor of a browser-based tool. There's also a significant change to the data model or how the files themselves would be associated with one another once ingested. Uh, and this change had follow on effects for the API endpoints used for access and also the packaging format used to prepare new items for ingest. As we progressed in the process, consuming upgrade documentation, meeting with vendor support and engineering, and especially rolling out our own testing environment, the impact that each of these changes would have and, and the impact that they would have on the custom software that we had running um, really became apparent. And this brings us to one of our first lessons learned. And that is the need to as exhaustively as possible and as early as possible, test the next version or replacements for tools that are being deprecated and determine if they're applicable to specific local use cases. In our case, the primary replacement method for preparing data for ingest lacked two features that were used extensively in two of our most commonly used packaging automations. Finding this out early via extensive testing allowed us to discuss with the vendor and shift to a less publicized but fully supported alternative that was closer in operation to the previous version's feature set and gave us a path forward. So within the areas of packaging, ingest management and access, there are a number of just different custom tools that required some level of modification, and in one case, a complete rewrite to maintain the same level of service. Looking at these cases, we served fairly different roles in supporting the development process for each. First, for an update to the packaging and ingest tool created and maintained for the museums and galleries by engineers and central IT. We played a role in providing sample packages in various formats in completing some exploratory testing. Second, our digitization workflow tool uh, that had been created and maintained by an external contractor on behalf of our digital reformatting unit. Um, on this project, we provided support uh, mainly through the design of system interaction 
and did extensive exploratory testing to be able to conclusively answer questions from that development team as they arose. For our digitized AV packaging tool, we embarked on a complete rewrite due to the deprecation of the previously used SDK. In this project, we served as project lead, providing specification, testing, and helping with the deployment and operation design. Uh, on this project, the development and programming was performed by an engineer in library IT, and we collaborated with our DevOps team on the deployment plan. For both internal and vendor access platforms, we provided API testing and uh, did some example usage-based testing uh, for their use cases. And lastly, there are a number of different project-based packaging scripts that had been developed within the Digital Preservation Services Unit over the years that needed updating. And on these projects, we served as the primary developers, testers, and end users. A lesson learned from this point in the process has been to be flexible and cognizant of the needs to provide different levels and different types of support based on the different products, teams, and implementations that are being worked on. We knew that given the large amount of changes, the more we could do to support internal and external developers working on the integrations, the better. In some cases, the support uh, would be an overview of changes and access to documentation. In others, regular meetings throughout the development process were most effective. And for others, diagrams and written specifications uh, were the most efficient way to communicate the changes. And that brings us to the primary development that we completed within our own unit. The Yell Easy SIP Creator is a command line program written in Python for creating packages for ingest Preservica. These packages utilize and expose all of the features of the new version data model. The packaging process involves minting UUIDs, creating file checksums, and producing other required metadata after processing the files that will be ingested. This utility was initially built up from our testing and exploratory scripts that we had originally written when we were assisting and answering questions posed by the development teams on the custom software integrations discussed above. And the result has been a replacement for the now deprecated vendor packaging tool, um, and specifically for use in our own unit scripts and automations, but with the added benefit that we can easily modify and add features as we need them. And following the creation of the command line tool, I was encouraged by my manager to explore creating a user-facing application to replace the deprec deprecated desktop packager. As someone who isn't a software engineer or primarily a developer, the thought of moving from command line scripts to working on a full-blown desktop-oriented program was somewhat intimidating. However, utilizing the Python GUI module for the UI, it was a fairly straightforward process to extend the command line tool that we had developed, and the Yes Creator was born. In this implementation, the GUI package handles the generation of the UI, allowing us to pass arguments to the command line tool using the UI elements you see on the screen uh, to set each one of those arguments and options. We then use the Pi installer software to generate binaries for Windows and are currently testing binaries for Mac OS and Linux. The end result is a user-friendly replacement that fulfills much of the functionality provided by the deprecated tool with the added benefit that we're able to make customizations and feature additions as needed, especially things that are useful locally that may not have wider use outside of the library. Lastly, we have some final lessons learned. We found that we could best support the needs of developers through performing our own exploratory testing, allowing us to better answer questions and directly provide solutions. In the course of this work, we found the testing scripts that we built out could grow into utilities for our own use, and that those utilities could eventually grow into end-user facing software. And finally, we learned to be open to developing user facing software ourselves, especially with tools like GUI and Pi Installer. Um, when they can be utilized to very efficiently build on top of command line tools, it's a very user friendly process to build those applications. Thank you again for having me please feel free to be in contact by email with any questions. Thank you. All right, I don't know if we have any method of getting questions to, oh, I don't know if we have any method for getting uh, questions to David, but probably on Slack. Um, 
and the next talk we have it is uh, in person. Uh, Beyond Kim, uh, caught between clarity and flexibility: How to better plan development and IT work. That's the last one. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> Should be, oh, it's on the desktop. desktop on the oh, okay. This one? No, no. There you go. That's it. This one. All right. Well, let's drag it over here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Thank you. I'm so sorry to uh, take you away from your uh, dog slide. I don't have any doggy on, <laughs> on mine, so I feel a little bad. Well, let's see what we can do. So hold on. Let me get my pointer. Make sure I can move. Okay, excellent. So I will go pretty quickly because I have only 10 minutes. So switching a little bit of gears. Uh, I am very excited to be here to talk about IT project planning today. So the topic that I would like to talk about is, okay, when our work exceeds capacity, how do we plan and manage our project? And this is sort of a perennial problem for almost all IT units. So what challenges do we encounter when we try to manage a situation like this? What may go wrong in our approach to meet those challenges, and how can we address various issues that surface along the way? Uh, so I will cover how our IT division at the University of Michigan Library addressed these issues and how we went about revamping our previous approach to IT project planning. And also today I'm presenting by myself, but I just want to thank uh, all my IT team members because this has been definitely a collective work. So to the members of our LIT coordinating group members and many other folks in my IT division participated in this. So as a very quick background, the University of Michigan Library's LIT division, library IT division, has more than 50 people in five departments, uh, including 15 developers, several DevOps engineers, three UX specialists, and three project managers. So I say this because it can give you an impression that this may make us look like a relatively sizable library IT team. However, we operate and support almost 100 products in total. So when we compiled a list of all projects that we wanted to get through just during this spring semester, the total number turned out to be as many as 24. So that's a lot of projects to manage for one semester. Uh, so for the past several years, LIT has been organizing our IT project work using the cycle planning approach. So one cycle lasts four months, and all IT projects were slotted into these cycles. And we even built an application for that, just, just that for a particular purpose, as you can see here. And initially, this cycle planning approach was introduced as a solution to the very problem that I mentioned earlier of having to take on work whose volume exceeds our available resources. But then, since it was impossible to take in all requested projects, LIT started using a cycle as a container for work to be taken in rather than as a tool for real project planning. 
So the past cycle planning approach can be useful in certain aspects, but also some drawbacks emerged over the years. So for one, uh, cycle planning became increasingly formal in LIT, so less and less discussion took place about which project should be taken up over many others and why. Um, also, um, scope creep uh, has been seen in many projects. So the result was that more and more projects continued into subsequent cycles without an explicit plan or a good sense of when they would be finished. Also, more and more new projects started without a well sought out project plan with clear milestones and target date. Um, so that, that's why this has happened, that we kind of started using cycles as more of an artificial container rather than uh, something that would that genuinely help with our real project planning. Uh, and more drawbacks. So, so since LIT had to juggle many projects at the same time without sufficient resources, time allocation uh, has become also quite tricky. So as you can see here, uh, people's time came to be spread really thin over many projects uh, to the level as low as 5 to 10%, uh, which is practically meaningless, right? Uh, and as a result, under the cycle planning approach, many LIT projects continued over multiple cycles uh, without a clear completion date set as a goal and ended also in an unsatisfactory manner. So even when difficult projects were completed finally, the teams felt very little sense of accomplishment, which I found to be very problematic. So the way I saw it is that cycle planning created an illusion of planning by grouping work into cycles. And the cycle planning process ended up replacing uh, the real project pr planning itself uh, rather than helping us plan its project better. And to be fair, uh, planning for IT work, particularly development work that involves programming, is fraught with difficulties. So if you look at any literature, you, these will be pointed out. Estimating time for each project work can seem arbitrary, right? We all know that. Milestones and target dates can cause anxiety, and many people shun them even when actually they help, help their work. Uh, also, prioritizing projects when resources are clearly insufficient is very stressful, which is common in libraries. Uh, and also, IT teams end up accumulating many more projects over time. So by the time you are considering them, they have been sitting there for years, so they are all quite important. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So this situation was also less an idea from my perspective as an administrator. For one, it made our project work appear to be delivered considerably late to people outside of the IT division because they don't really know what is going on. Uh, and secondly, due to how projects have been managed in LIT, uh, our folks, ourselves, uh, including me, had very little sense of how much work can be completed realistically given, given a certain amount of time and resources. So this made it nearly impossible for us to create a long-term plan to effectively manage uh, our product and its overall IT portfolio. So big trouble, right? Uh, so, but the good thing that I discovered was that people in my division generally agreed that we have a problem. So we all knew that cycle planning approach needs to be revisited. But the LIT coordinating group, which is a designated team uh, that reviews, evaluates, and decides on projects to be pursued at each cycle, was not sure about what other than current uh, approach could serve as a viable new option. So they were very worried about the risk of making planning work overly complex and time consuming because our current approach was pretty time consuming. Also, there was a tr tremendous amount of anxiety about moving away from the current practice, even though people were not happy about it because they felt safer. And then lastly, some people expressed very strong discomfort about estimating how much time would be needed for each project, particularly development project. Creating a project timeline and adding explicit milestones and associating them with target dates. Once I said the deadline and people did not want to talk to me for like days. <laughs> Uh, and particularly about the last one was a very sticky point. 
But uh, my understanding was that these are all very understandable concerns that need to be addressed, but they are not a reason to abandon project planning altogether. So to get some buy-in uh, for a change, I decided to do some clarification. So first, time estimates, milestones, and target dates are meant to serve as a useful structure to ensure that the project work moves forward with a momentum and a mechanism to signal any issues when they arise. But they are not intended to be an instrument to drive people to overwork or to force an unrealistic deadline. So this needed to be made very clear to folks. Uh, secondly, difficulty in estimating a project duration is not a reason for making no estimate at all. That's different, like you can adjust that, but that does not mean that you would not plan at all. Also, spending time on carefully and thoughtfully crafting a project plan is a worthwhile investment, not an unnecessary add-on to existing work. And lastly, project planning and management is ultimately the responsibility of all members of the project team. Because uh, some folks would say, well, can we just hire more project managers and then we'll be done with this? And <laughs> it does not work that way, right? So now I want to show you what we did next based upon this renewed understanding about project planning. So the uh, library IT division's coordinating group adopted a minimum project plan as a requirement for all project proposals. These, uh, this template includes a well-defined project scope, what is in scope, out of scope need to be specified, clear set of deliverables, also an estimate of the project duration with a timeline and milestones, and a contingency plan to mitigate any known risks while the project is underway. So none of this is like earth shattering, but there is definitely a benefit to actually make this as a part of the um, uh, project selection process. Uh, we also created a template for the minimal LIT project planning share, which includes three different types of tabs. So this is the first timeline tab. So this shows all approved projects placed on the LIT-wide project timeline for a specific duration, in this case from February uh, to June 2023. And I can already uh, tell you one of these projects that were supposed to be over by the end of last month is still going. <laughs> But our plan is that we're going to record that so that we're going to have a better idea of how actual work takes how long. And we also have individual project tabs in this share. So individual project uh, tabs uh, show each individual project with the people assigned for the project and their roles and their time allocation. And department has a need to track how much of the time of their folks are assigned to which project. So they do it in department tabs. And the coordinating group also decided to create a Slack channel where project leads will provide weekly project updates. So this is a relatively low effort activity. We don't require a huge amount of uh, updates every week. It's just whatever the project leads wants to uh, provide the update. Um, and the purpose is so that any issues related to project progress can be surfaced for early discussion and feedback, and that would help us make needed adjustment on a uh, timely benefit, benefit, uh, basis. And people have also uh, already noted that how these updates actually help them feel more connected to each other's work and give them better awareness of LIT's project work as a whole. Uh, and also, most importantly, I think, people are adopting signature animated emojis. It's not actually animated, but we are getting this for each project, so people are very enthusiastic about this. We have a lot of emojis in our Slack channel, so that's just something that is gaining a lot of traction. Uh, and all of this is combined with a bi-weekly meeting of the LIT coordinating group, where we check on each LIT project that is underway and review any issues. So to wrap up, it is important to note that project planning and management alone cannot solve the problem of limited resources. The resource constraint itself uh, cannot be fixed by planning, right? But good project planning and management practices can ensure that at least the selected projects proceed smoothly and are completed successfully, thereby making project work more rewarding to everyone. That's all I have, thank you.
And all my notes are gone. I wonder which one of these it is. No. Well, you know what? I wrote down the tiny URL. I am here. I am here. Oh, well, someone's here. I'm here. Okay. I think we have a, 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 a hmm? Oh, okay. We, we have a, a talk. Uh, and I don't have the notes in front of me, but it's a, a, a and a, a dashboard might help maintenance for your back end service by Naomi Dishe. And Naomi's here. I am here, and so it's one of my cats. This is Vinsky. He wants to help. Um, so thanks for your patience. Um, so this uh, this talk is about something we did here at um, Stanford, my team put together. Um, and part of the motivation was that the error monitoring, monitoring app we use, which is Honey Badger, we were getting errors that the team really didn't understand. We were getting them, they kept coming, we didn't know what to do, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what was the real problem? Well, this was from a backend service, particular service that only one person on our team understood well. Uh, it was a complex service because it did multiple functions. And if you happen to be at the talk that um, Mike Giarlo and Justin Lippman gave yesterday, uh, you saw a topology diagram that showed how complex our ecosystem is. And the code itself is uh, was very tough to understand uh, it was written five years ago with some old practices um, and the errors that we um, that we saw they would they would occur or you know we'd get new errors and we didn't know how to fix them and we didn't know how urgent they were and we kept getting more errors um, and then it turns out there were other errors that never even got to the error monitoring app and we had documentation but it was a little hard to navigate um, so. Why did we make a dashboard? Because everyone wants sparkly rainbows, of course. Um, but really, we wanted a visual representation of it's working or it's not working. Um, OK, that's great. But like, really, why did we need a dashboard? We needed some information that we weren't getting from our server monitoring, uh, from the message queue manager for the background jobs. And we were struggling, all of us, to have a good mental model of this whole service and which, what are the metrics, what's broken, what does success look like, and wanting to have some information for the, you know, what we call the drunken coder, where you're trying to figure out how you're supposed to fix something and you barely have enough information. Um, so um, for this dashboard, we, we tried to approach it with an agile approach. Uh, First of all, who are their consumers? Um, well, really, it's the people on our team, the developers, and some developer adjacent staff, um, people that pretty much can speak developer when required. And we needed to know what information was in there to put on the dashboard. And what we really wanted was some data from the database and some explanations. So um, I did the first prototype. Um, and it wasn't beautiful and it went through some iterations and it still is pretty ugly, but it does the job. So this is the, um, the header and the left nav sidebar. Um, and if you were to, I'm not doing this live because it's very slow <laughs> and that's okay with us. It serves our purposes. Um, if you click the about button, you get an overview of the app's functions and that's in the header. So it's always available. 
So if somebody needs a little bit of context, they can get it and they can click the button and make it go away. I should mention, I also took the opportunity to learn a little more bootstrap because I'm pretty clunky with it. So this was, you know, not fancy, but it still was a learning opportunity. Um, so you saw on the left nav, there's sort of like these three areas. So this first one is the objects on premises and if they look okay or not. And if things don't look okay, one of the um, the cells in the table will show as um, background red. So it really brings your eye to where the problem is. Um, when I took this screenshot, this was okay, but that wasn't always true when we first brought up the dashboard. Um, when we have problems with our replication part of this service, um, they show up, as you can see, the, the top thing is the error overall for all of the pieces of what that tab would show. And again, we have more context, whoops, I got excited. Um, we have more context and uh, it really indicates where the errors are and gets you started a little better. And then this last part, we have a whole auditing system set up and um, there's context for this as well. Um, what this really did for us is that it meant that the whole team had a better understanding of what was going on. And if there was a problem, like I made a couple tickets like this where I just did a little mini screenshot of what was showing in the dashboard and said, okay, this isn't, this isn't um, okay. So let's figure out what the problem is. And doing the tickets this way seemed to help people feel like they understood what they were doing. Um, and then we had some benefits that we weren't uh, expecting out of this, which was the dashboard surfaced some data problems that our, our um, the person who really understood the service wasn't aware of, um, and we were able to chase them down and fix them. Um, at Stanford, we have what we call product owners for when we do a, a, a bunch of work on, on an area. Um, and this product owner is not on our team. And he really liked what the dashboard showed him. Um, we found it was easier to talk across the teams, like our team talking to our operations team, that sort of thing. Um, and as soon as the dashboard spun up, people started saying, oh, I'd love to be able to see this. Oh, I'd love to be able to get these stats and so on. So it it really surfaced some needs for information that we haven't been able to address yet, but that are in the in the mix. So um, some of you saw that I, I had uh, done a poll in the Code for Live channel about um, whether people would know the Brady Bunch reference, and it turned into this big... Um, intellectual property thing, but I thought I'd really share my lovely lyrics with you as my closing slide. But um, I'm N. Duche in Slack, and uh, I look forward to your questions, and thank you very much. I've got the notes on my phone this time. All right. Oh, boy. I think that's the end of all of our talks. Um, we have some announcements before the breakout sessions. Uh, lightning talk signups for tomorrow morning are available now on the post by the registration desk. Uh, breakout session sign up for tomorrow at 11 a.m. is now available on the post by the Four Science sponsor table. Uh, we have breakout sessions uh, from 2.15 to 3.15 today, and then we have our afternoon break from 3.15 to 3.30. Uh, poster sessions will begin immediately after the break from 3.30 to 4, uh, out by the sponsor tables. Poster presenters, be sure to make yourself available at your poster to take questions around 3.30. Uh, we will reconvene in the main session room at 4 for day two's final block of talks. The live stream will resume at that time. Somebody needs to tell us where the breakout sessions are. <laughs> Someone does. Right here? Maybe. Esme? Esme. Do we know what rooms are at? What are the Esme knows. So we don't have a bunch of extra rooms. We have this big room, and we have the first floor. 
Sorry, I know I need to use the mic. Uh, we don't have a bunch of extra rooms. We do have this whole building, and there are lots of places in it that we could use for small groups. I think this room could easily accommodate several large groups in the corners. Do we know how many people want to go to the different things? Raise your hand. Digitization. Are you asked? All right. All right, can you? Thank you, Carolyn. All right, who is interested in digitization and project management? All right, well, I'll read all of them. So number one is digitization and project management. Number two is how to defend yourself against a dagger-armed brigand in uh, Quattrocento, Italy. Uh, three is Tmux. Four is Archive Space. Five is Migration Station, Islandora, and Friends. Six is Python for Lib, ongoing Python chat. And then the last one is Blacklight Developers. Oh, sorry. The penultimate one is Blacklight Developers. And then Fluent and Mark Can't Code, Keep Me Company. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're too late to add one more. All right, who is interested in digita digitization and project management? I see one hand. Uh, all right, that's a, that's a pretty small group. Uh, I'm going to say just at the beginning, that group should meet at that door and find a place upstairs. Who is interested in how to defend yourself against a dagger arm brigand? OK, you all meet at that door. Who is interested in Tmux? Um, yeah, that is also a pretty small group, uh, but I know that Carrie is one of them, so why don't you meet here at the podium? Uh, who is interested in archive space? All right, lots of people interested in archive space. Let's go with this corner for archive space. Who is interested in the migration station? Um, pretty good group. Let's meet in that corner over there. Uh, who is interested in Python for Lib? Who's interested in Python for Lib? <laughs> All right, back corner. Uh, who is interested in Blacklight Developers? All right, that corner back there. Uh, who is fluent in Mark and wants to keep someone company? <laughs> All right. Okay, we had a number. All right. Also, wait a minute. We already have somebody in the back corner. All right. Come up over here. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. See you back at 4 o'clock.
Challenges with Iron Bull is that it's a very small department. And everyone's fighting for somebody else to do something else. And you really feel that you want to help that you may. Uh, we do development for our clients, but you know, only very limited resources. And none of them are in a place to step up and sponsor the development of a subgroup or you know, something like that. Where they can
So what are you doing when you're getting married? What are you doing?
very very interesting.
All right, folks, you don't have to stop talking, but it's break time. So uh, we have 15 minutes break and then poster session.
All right, folks, you don't have to stop talking, but it's 3.30 and the poster session is starting. And it's, it's right out there. How much time do we have? Um, about 25 minutes. Oh, okay. Do you see what see what the screen is doing? Yeah, a waterfall. <laughs> oh, fun. I hope we don't have to like, turn earlier. everything on and off, but that happens. No, we're good. Cool. Oh. All right, scared me. So. <laughs> Boy, that is very large. Uh, uh, Near-controlled lending. Okay. Ooh, this one. 
Oh. Alright. I need to... F I need to find these two people, because they need to load their slides. Um, I'll, I'll get these t two up. One, this is two. <laughs> All right, uh, you can feel free to load yours. No, I'm speaking. Yep.
That would be impossible. Oh my god. Gestures. Wait. Alright. Oh yeah, it's right here. It I can put I it. Saw it. I can put it in the other window. Okay. Links are there. Um, there is a presentation up here. Yes, yeah, so that's so, okay. Yeah. Cool. One, two, three, just have to Can you just show me how the presentation looks like with the um, with my notes? Is it possible to see my notes and what I? Um, so I, I think you go like you go here, and you choose presenter view. Is that possible? So then I see that, but then do they see the? Then we've got to move this whole window over to. Confidence monitor, and that's what gets displayed on the screen. Okay, will someone help me, or should I do it myself? Like, what's the? Um, someone will help you. Okay, yeah. but they, they're probably familiar with conference notes, right? I, I think so. I mean, yeah. um, uh, yeah. power presenter notes. Presenter notes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so then you just leave that, and then someone yeah, will we'll help take me. Yeah, this full screen. Okay, so and then I read that. Perfect. Yep. And then if I wanted to make this bigger, I can just drag the whole thing open, right? Perfect. Awesome. All right, thank you. I'm not going first, so I no, can... No, you're going yeah, second. Yeah, yep. so I'll just... Thank you so much. Yep, of course. It doesn't course. matter where I am. Then you, are you Matt? No. No, I'm Peter. I'm, Peter. I'm fourth today, but okay. I'm keeping right. the laptop from going to sleep. I, I see. That's a...
Okay, uh, ev- so we have like a everyone in there knows the sign in now. Just in so just in case oh. it happens, okay, you can okay. kind of wave. They should be watching. They'll know, they'll recognize it. But if not, you can always you can wave, or even if you talk through this, they'll hear you. Very good. No, uh, Vincent. Uh, I'm just keeping it awake for the uh, forecast. Oh, okay. Uh, come on up. One would be better. I think just do it at the end of the. A couple windows here. I mean, I think they closed it, but. Yeah, I can just open a new tab here. Okay. Because I think they closed it. Let me just do. Actually, ask to clear the cache, but I think I wouldn't have to do that. Okay. Yeah. Comment after. Yeah. Okay.
Keep starting it again. Uh, how else can I turn out? Let me try another. Hey, Hardy, are you going to get this thing started? Four o'clock. If not, I'll start. Come on back into the room, everyone. I am not your MC because it would seem our MC has bailed on us, but we are in the group seven talks, the final four talks of the afternoon, uh, four in-person talks. Uh, the first is James and Ben, Beyond Descriptive Metadata. Do you need presenter notes? Yeah, uh, I don't think I have any. Uh, oh, just oh. give me one of the slideshow. How do I advance? Just one of the arrow keys? Yep. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you all had coffee in the break. I needed it, too. Um, today, I'm joined by uh, Ben Armitage from Columbia University Libraries, and we're going to talk about going beyond descriptive metadata. Uh, my name is James English. I am the. I work on the Prowess Project Division, a new division at Lyricist. You may need to use the actual hand mic. The hand mic? Okay. I normally have two. Lean over. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah, I get the feedback now. <laughs> All right. So moving beyond descriptive metadata. Uh, again, my name is James English. I'm in the Palace Project Division, a new division at Lyricist. Um, the Palace Project is part of Lyricist now. We are a global nonprofit. If you don't know who we are, we're in multiple countries across the world, and we do a number of things that makes us sometimes confusing to understand who we are. Uh, we work with uh, the academic uh, libraries, public libraries, museums, archives, and repositories uh, for uh, open source community hosted software to hosting open source communities, all the way to content acquisitions, traditional uh, consortial type services, training, and then actual uh, open source software development. 
So the Palace Project, being the newest division here, is one of the projects that we we are doing. It is, uh, I'll describe it later, but it's been growing over the last year since we just started the project. We're in over 18 states and one territory, American Samoa. Um, 10 IMLS pilot libraries, very small libraries that can't afford to have ebook services that we are uh, piloting with. And then why I'm here today, the three academic libraries and partners that we have uh, to bring this technology um, into the academic library space. So what is that technology? Well, really simple, it's an ebook reader on a mobile app. Um, it does. It is a little bit unique in the industry in that what it's really designed to do is not just uh, funnel users into a particular vendor's uh, ebook service for a, a library, but to actually funnel different content providers into a library's ebook reading experience on a mobile device. And so it comprises both a front end and a back end integration layer uh, that works with the different uh, systems and ebook vendors out there that support libraries. So who can benefit from this? Well, pretty much every type of library. Uh, depending on how you are uh, organized as a library, whether you're a public library, a state library, an academic, or a K through 12, you probably acquire resources from multiple type of vendors and providers out there. But that has the kind of unfortunate benefit of fragmenting your user experience and making it confusing for people to access all the resources you may have, especially when it comes to ebooks. And that's what we really try to solve. Um, this is kind of really oversimplified uh, look at what we do, but basically if you look at where content resides on one side of the, the slide, you see that it resides in different publishers who may distribute that content or distribute that content to other wholesalers or retailers. Uh, you may have institutional repositories, y'all are familiar with those, that you have content including ebooks in. Uh, there may be open access or community type repositories out there like Awaken that uh, have, or Knowledge Unlatched that have a repository of content that you may want to make available. And then there are the licensed vendors and aggregators and different uh, ebook publishers that try to provide that direct. All of that we try to integrate into one user experience or offer a solution for different providers and authors of content to make that content easily uh, integrated into the broader collection that defines a library. So I'm gonna pass uh, the slide on, uh, the rest of the presentation on to Ben to talk about one of the areas where we are doing this in academia, and that's around open uh, standards development. Ben? Thanks, James. Uh, so, uh, as we said earlier, I'm Ben Armentor. I'm at Columbia, and I'm, uh, I'm stepping in here to talk about OPDS and the trajectory of both the specification uh, and, its, uh, and implementation issues around it in Palace. And I just want to start with uh, a little acronym demystification. So OPDS, Open Publication Distribution System, that is, uh, is technically supposed to indicate something broader about an ecosystem of software, but it is used colloquially largely uh, just to talk about the catalog format, which is a syndication format for information about electronic resources. And when I think about OPDS as a matter of trajectory, it has uh, uh, actually a fairly long history. Um, it was initially drafted in 2009, uh, and I think it really typifies a split in the, uh, the mid-90s web services, uh, two trajectories of web service development uh, in the mid-90s, right, where you have business to business or machine to machine, what you might call enterprise web services, uh, following one track, uh, a lot of schema validation um, that tend to be higher complexity over here, and another track which was really targeted at direct to client delivery of API data. And I'm locating here that trajectory from RSS to Atom the initial draft of OPDS is actually built right on top of Atom. It's uh, extensions to Atom. And the uh, subsequent revision there, and I'm talking about ODL, is a way to add license and authorization information to OPDS. Um, so those were XML web services in that stretch between uh, 2009 and 2015. Other things were happening, and one of them was that the, uh, the preferred formats for direct-to-client, lightweight uh, API services started to uh, be built uh, around JSON, around a, a way to mark object data up as JavaScript that could be executed or uh, deserialized in a browser. And 
subsequent to that, uh, a, uh, an in-browser EPUB reader called Redium JS was developed. And the combination of these two effects resulted in a major revision of the OPDS spec in 2017 that was built on the web publication manifest work uh, in Redium and redesigned not to be an Atom XML feed, but rather to be a JSON syndication feed. Um, but back on that other, the other side of the, uh, the web services trajectory chart, those enterprise services also uh, developed over that time. So I want to briefly not talk about OPDS and instead talk about some things that were happening in the enterprise space, particularly with regard to libraries. So uh, there's a, uh, a set of, uh, of related technologies up here, open URL, which doesn't have a logo, and I used its, uh, its author's Herbert Van de Sample's <laughs> logo instead. Uh, counter and, uh, and CSV, which has existed since time immemorial. Uh, but these, these are all technologies that informed a UK serials group report in 2007 called Link Resolvers and the Serials Supply Chain. And that is the report that ultimately resulted in the KBART recommended practice. Um, quick show of hands, people who are, have KBART-based integrations for their collections. Yeah. So in that report, we see uh, the, uh, the author, James Culling, say one of the greatest opportunities in the existing supply chain is further automated cooperation between link resolver suppliers and subscription agents. Through assisting the library in the knowledge-based localization test more directly, the subscription agent can play a very valuable role. What's a subscription agent? So the, uh, the position of this report was that open URL gave you a way to identify uh, an agent that might provide content, but needed help in negotiating the particulars of access to that content, of actually acquiring the content, and that subscription agents uh, had a, a role to play there. In a lot of library systems, those agents might actually be your catalog. You may have built a lot of local customizations to something to work out how you get a ProQuest ebook, for example. Um, more interim there, I'm going to uh, briefly say that this project builds on me being late. It, uh, it builds on uh, work that New York Public did for the Library Simplified Open Ebook Ecosystems, uh, uh, Library Simplified Simply E uh, ebook reading application. Um, this is in the links I posted to the Slack. This is an excellent technical primer on OPDS. I don't think that I have a lot to contribute to the technical description of this presentation, so instead I want to encourage people to look at this. But I do want to talk about some of the business context for this, which is, um, and this, this list might go further in, uh, to 2005, but in 2009, uh, Amazon acquired a company called LexCycle. LexCycle's founder was the person who initiated the draft spec for OPDS as an effort to try and open up the ebook ecosystem. And that initiated a two-year cycle of Amazon beginning to wind down applications that they thought were threats to the Kindle ecosystem. Uh, and in that time, they were, uh, they were joined by Overdrive, major ebook lender in the public library space, who began slowly removing transferability clauses from their contracts uh, and essentially eroding the, uh, the concept of ownership for libraries. So when the, when the Library Simplified project emerges in 2012 to develop an e-reader here, it's, it's occurring in a very specific context of trying to help public libraries avoid vendor enclosure and make sure that they continue to have access to their collections and their readers have, uh, have access to that material. Uh, so that's uh, public libraries. The research library ebook landscape surely is totally different. Ha ha ha, maybe not so much, right? We are also in a market dominated by a handful of vendors. We have uh, separate, sometimes duplicative uh, applications for accessing that content. They're stored in a variety of systems. Uh, and the APIs where they are available are often intermittently available or not complete enough to be uh, usable in, our, uh, in workflows uh, in our libraries. Uh, so some lessons that we might draw from KBART are just to engage with uh, the history of syndication. So when you build a syndication format, you often find that things like deletions are difficult to express. There's a history of that in, uh, in Atom. Maybe it's uh, using the Dublin Core valid field to try and indicate an expiry of, a, uh, of an entry or an actual extension to indicate a deleted entry, uh, other, uh, other factors like that, which, uh, which are obstacles to library integration. So last year, we partnered with Lyricist 
NYU, the University of California, and ProQuest to try and make a difference in this. And I want to take a moment uh, to identify Joe Arambelsky and Chelsea Miller at ProQuest, who did a huge amount of work to stand up OPDS feeds that we could use directly in Palace and not go through a ProQuest app. Um, so I, I'm going to skip the next steps. The, so there's an OPDS working group. And if you're interested in this stuff, you should join it. Uh, and the, uh, the ODL specification is to accommodate authorization cases. But you're probably familiar with these. If you want to see them implemented in OPDS, you should join that working group. Uh, we're trying to use these in our libraries. If you are interested in supporting changes to OPDS to make it easier to incorporate them directly in your catalog, you should join that working group. Uh, and finally, a, a, a quick uh, 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 summary of where we got uh, right now, uh, just as a matter of publishers. So where can you get an OPDS feed if you're going to stand up a Palace Collection Manager right now? Internet Archive Book Server, Feedbooks, a largely European catalog. Uh, ProQuest themselves has code that they can turn on for your library if you're a ProQuest customer. Uh, Castellini Libri, these are all in place. Columbia has developed, and here I'm going to shout out uh, Bonnie Gordon, who's a recently joined member of our team who led development on this, a shim that wraps up Springer Books API and exposes it as an OPDS2 feed that can be redeployed at other libraries and used to, uh, to incorporate your Springer collections uh, into the Palace ecosystem. And Fulcrum is cooperating with us now on an OPDS2 feed. In the next year, we are uh, going to try and get Springer to just run that feed for us and incorporate Taylor and Francis and EBSCO eBooks. Uh, if this is successful, this is a really huge chunk of the, uh, of the eBooks that you probably subscribe to. Thanks. Um, I think it's unlikely that you're going to find us at the table after 4 o'clock. Uh, but it, there's a Slack for the Palace project. Get in touch with me or James, and we will make sure you find your way to it. Thank you. I have to move this guy over, right? Yeah. Um, it might be easier if you just click on the. Yeah, I'm not a math person. And I'm really good at Sam. <laughs> I was having trouble reading it. <laughs> I just have this one here. <laughs> no, I'm wearing the wrong pair of glasses. So close that. All right, I do not have to lean over. Okay, um, I'm gonna have to speak like 1.5x, right? Because uh, I have like 20 minutes of stuff, but I wanna hear the other speakers. So hi, I'm Nancy Lin. I'm the Senior Data Project Strategist at um, NYU Libraries. I spent most of my career in publishing, developing electronic products at Wiley, Oxford, and NYU Press. I have a library degree from the University of Michigan. And at NYU Libraries, I'm now chairing the working group responsible for the migration of our e-resources to Alma and Primo V uh, discovery system. Um, this includes over 4 million e-books and 266,000 e-journals. And in addition to um, this work, I'm a data project strategist working on promoting interoperability and discovery within our larger e-resources ecosystem. Some of my projects include mapping our bookstore course books um, to our library e-books. Uh, developing the Palace app ebook reader and promoting open access ebooks. So, as the number of open access ebooks grows, libraries see a proliferation in the same titles in dozens of different platforms. This duplication of titles creates challenges, including presentation of too many links to users, inability to gather holistic user statistics for funders and internal analysis and lack of universal IDs as well as difficulty in presenting users with links to their desired formats. NYU is supporting efforts by University of Michigan Press, NYU Press on their current efforts to publish OA books. NYU Press has an OA site called Open Square and University of Michigan is publishing OA ebooks through Fulcrum. 
It is still really challenging for these nonprofit organizations to create an economic model for sustainability. For example, University of Michigan must report back their OA usage statistics regularly to get support and buy-in from the administration. JSTOR, OAPEN, and Fulcrum provide them with usage reports, but not all the platforms do. And even if they did, it would be very difficult to match the IDs because they're different in all the different platforms. So University of Michigan calculated that the average cost of producing an academic monograph um, is around $27,000. So in a sample book that I'm going to be talking about soon, the price of a print book is was $65. So um, you know it's a typical uh, academic book where you can sell 500, 700 copies, and that would, that would break even for the cost and also be able to pay print royalties. Um, and the open access ebook would then be sustainable. Project Muse is uh, experimenting with other subscribe to own models, and Taylor and Francis also has some retrospective open access projects. As you can see from this directory of open access ebooks um, chart, we're seeing an exponential growth and so we're at a critical juncture now to make sure that we participate in its success. Since DOAB and OAPEN um, are one of the largest uh, current repositories of, of OA ebooks, we're currently working with OAPEN to make um, their OA ebooks accessible in MOVIT devices via this, this, the uh, Palace app. So now I'm going to focus on one of our OA books just to show you how this exponential growth is getting out of control. Um, however, even if you're not working directly with academic OA ebooks, I think the issues that I'm talking about are universal and pertain to any digital object. Um, we all have similar challenges like uh, universal ID numbers, deduplication, automation, dealing with metadata, usage statistics, access rights, linking, preservation. Do you use manifest? How do you, how do you, um, you know, how does it function within a larger ecosystem? And so much of all these different links are just silos and they, you know, the, the JSTOR silo fits, sits in the JSTOR silo and follows, um, you know, the way they have, it's chunked by chapters because JSTOR is a serials based, you know, or originated that way as opposed to an ebook um, site. So, <clears throat> so are we going to keep replicating these this work so that we have um, so many multiple platforms, or can we use open standards to create services and applications that promote interoperability? Um, we can then instead work on splitting some of the work in cataloging, um, making ID lookup tables and APIs so that we can all share in that. We can add textual analysis. We can promise retention like we're doing with print, shared, shared retention, um, preservation. I'm looking forward to hearing the next two speakers um, on, on you know, related work. It's, it's all about, um, you know, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of time, but now having nine versions of the same open access ebook with different IDs is not really uh, going to go well when you you know, explode that out to hundreds of thousands of books. Um, so here's an example of how a new service was created merely by using the open standards that James and uh, Ben just discussed. And so Michigan created with Lyricist an, open, an OPDS feed, um, which now we consume and, it, and, and our users are now um, able to read their, these books in, in the Palace app. So as you can see, I mean, many of us deal with metadata. This is not very, uh, it's not really that complicated and you actually have that data and many of the publishers have the data just in order to, you know, serve us the books. They know who, which libraries uh, own and which, one, which ones are open access. And so it's just asking for this data in a way that a machine can understand it. A machine often can't understand Mark. A machine often can't get all the data that it needs, as you know, Ben and James discussed earlier. We need more pieces of data to be able to produce something like this. And so, um, I mean, I'm not exaggerating when that, those, you know, those two pages that we just showed, this and this, you know, created this, and it's really that simple. And of course, the Simply E app and the Palace app, they worked very, very hard, you know, for many, many years, but it's used by thousands of, of pub public libraries now. And if you're, you know, in, in uh, Brooklyn Public Library, I use the Palace app all the time. New York Public Library has their Simply E. Um, so I, man, I live in New York, I can use both. And so our users are familiar with this product. And um, 
we are we have now about 286,000 titles, including the Michigan titles, the uh, the ProQuest titles that we discussed earlier. Um, how am I on time? Uh, not good, probably. Um, okay, so yeah, so open standards equals interoperability. So it's not just you know the OPDS. We're we're consuming this data in JSON. We are trying to build an open uh, open standard based DRM instead of like everybody uses Adobe and Adobe is a black box and they're not developing it. And so, we, you know, when, when, when people think about um, security and it, it's like open sounds like, oh, it's open source, everybody can understand it. It's, it's about sharing an open standard that everybody then can use. And then you can be creative. I don't have to spend my time just worrying about matching titles and, you know, I can worry, I can spend that time more fruitfully. Um, so, so this is a quick example. We spun up this, we, we took um, data that OAPEN gave us and added like 100 titles, again, instantly by just following that format than any of us. I mean, it's really just plugging in the data. Um, <clears throat> there's always a, a bit of tweaking, but you know, we got the 100 OAPEN titles into our Palace app with, that, with very little work, and we will continue to work with OAPEN to try to uh, to create this feed so that others can do it. And maybe, I mean, my goal would be to like, just have an open access academic uh, uh, palace uh, library that anybody can, can offer to their users. Um, so just quickly, I'm gonna walk through what a user might encounter when they end up on this book, right? So, you know, there's all these different formats, but they don't have the information they need. Like, what's the difference between these formats? Which ones are EPUB? Which ones are downloadable? Which ones require a login if I wanna, you know, give it to my students to, to add. Um, and I just wanted to quickly bring up the, what everyone forgets too, is that our workflow is based on things that we buy. And then our mark records up here, if we don't buy something, it's really kind of not, it, it, it falls off the radar. And I think that happens for a lot of libraries and we have to work to um, create another uh, a way for acquisitions. And these are front list eBooks from major academic presses. These are not just old scans of GovDocs from 100 years ago. Um, these are solid things that we would acquire if they weren't free, but because they're free, we kind of don't have a, a workflow for them. And this slide is very interesting. 42 merged OCLC numbers. I mean, how efficient can that be? And, and the reason why is because there's everybody's you know throwing their, their records into OCLC, wh whoever, uh, all the different silos, right? And so then it just gets out of control and any of these numbers could be in your system at the time that um, you catalog them and maybe you don't update. So it, it, it really is out of control. And some people say, oh, well, why don't you use DOI numbers? Well, this book has three DOI numbers, so so much for that as, as like the number, right? And then, of course, bad news, I'm going into Alma Community Zone. I'm sure some of you are in Alma Community Zone. There's, there's only one of the uh, ISBNs in there, and there are zero OCLC numbers in there. So like, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's gonna be, yeah, so. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> Um, I, I yeah, really, I mean, really, they really need to work with each other because this is such a waste of time to like lose that. You know, that is actually that master record helps me at least have two ISBNs. It also had a seven seven six, so that I, my print can dedupe with my e. And so it, it, it's it, it's uh, pretty crazy. All right, I think I'm just gonna. Yeah, these are some numbers. I mean, a quarter of our ebooks like have the paid paywall version. But, like we don't dedupe it out, even though there's a free version. So you know it's it's really not that efficient. Um, these are some of the numbers, and they'll be in my they'll be in my uh, slideshow if you wanted to look further. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, you know we we talked about Redium. Uh, ben talked about Redium. So they they created this um, Thorium where. <clears throat> I mean, Dr. Tang's uh, talk was so amazing, and if you look at, you know, an EPUB within some of these new browsers, I mean, it, it's pretty incredible how you know this this one can read one x two x, and if you try on the PDF, it's 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 actually uh, not as flexible, and obviously, when you're ma making an e-reader app, the EPUB version can give a lot more flexibility. So. I think that um, you know 
like with DOAB and OAPEN, they chose to, to, to and, and, and Project Muse and JSTOR, they chose to just take the PDF file, because that's easier, that's the way their system runs. But we're leaving a lot behind if we're just ignoring the EPUB version. And so that's one of the challenges too. And, and, and what we have now in Palace is the ability to switch to the EPUB if the EPUB is available, and if the EPUB is not available, we, can, we, we do provide uh, the PDF version. And so, I mean, as Dr. Tang said, it's about choice, right? Maybe the user has a, a, a great PDF reader that they love and have configured, but then somebody else might want to use the Thorium reader. And because these are open access, we actually <clears throat> can give this to, um, the, you know, they can use which, whichever reader they want <clears throat> and download it. Um, so, yeah, so just quickly, I mean, it, as a user, so these are all the links that you get. You can go to Michigan, you can go to, and they're all different. And then not only are they all different, some of them have two of them, and they have different numbers, so are they even the same book? Like, OAPEN has two versions of this. I don't know why. They have different numbers, that's probably why. And then DOAB, I mean, it took me a while to understand the difference between DOAB and OAPEN, but like, if you are a library that added both D OAPEN and DOAB books, you would have four of these, and two of them are duplicates. And it, it really is, you know, so, and Knowledge and Latch, I'm like, you know, I click through, and all of a sudden I'm on Fibio Labs, and then I'm on, you know, but then Wiley owns them, and people don't like them. I'm like, should I not use them? It's, 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 there's just, I mean, it doesn't even end. I think there's even more. Oh, it's on Pahathi Trusta, too. I mean, it, it um, so this is the, the JSTOR version. It's got um, just chapter downloads. J, uh, Project, Project Muse version is just cha chapter downloads. And so, I mean, you can also say, like, oh, yeah, you know, the more the merrier, but just think about how much work each of these places are, like they're maintaining their servers, they're putting links, and then I have to deal with like my 42 merged OCLC numbers. So uh, something should change and we should all work together on that. Um, so this is, I mean, shout out to Code for Lib. I took a pre-conference workshop and I used it like right away. So I said to my, I was like, you've got to be able to, instead of using metadata, instead of, I mean, and that the, the other talk about um, AI and I mean, mixing that with, so this distant reader app, <clears throat> which was um, a workshop given by Eric Lee Morgan, he wrote the software. And so basically I stuck four of these PDFs into a folder and like it did its magic and then um, you know spit out all this information. So like two of them had the exact same word count and then two of them didn't, but then they were like, one of the key words was like the URL of, 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 a, of a ProQuest. So like it was their footer. Everything had the same footer at the bottom. So I'm sure if I could put stop words, I mean, there's, it's so simple to be able to use other methods for deduplication rather than like OCLC numbers and ISBNs because those are not so accurate. So hopefully maybe like down the road we can use these methods like out of the gate, tell the publishers I want, you know, I want to, you know, this count, that count, concordance, and it has to be in a manifest with this ID and that, and so that then as it travels as a digital object, it's not as crazy as it is now. Um, so yeah, so, the, so and that 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 software actually also took everything out of the PDF, and I and noticed that one of the versions had tabs between each word, and so again, I was you know inspired by Dr. Tang, and I was like, okay, let me try try a a browser or like a text reader on it and it just was like, you know, it, every time it hit a tab, it, 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 it halted. Anyway, it's just to show that the, the five PDFs and the two EPUBs that I had were kind of like slightly different and we have no quality control. We have no, um, we don't go back to the publishers and say, I need these things. I need you to pr provide us an OPDS feed. I need you to be able to give us a full download and tell me what that URL is. All right, so I'm out of time, but um, I have many ideas for how we could all work together. You can guess what some of them are based on what uh, I discussed. So, uh, you know, hit me up. I'm, I work with Lyricists, work with Columbia, California. We're all, um, you know, lo loving the opportunity to build these products. And I always say that the fact that we built this is really important to me because I, I don't want to just have this like in theory, it's in, in theory we should have open standards. Like I literally in theory ha should have open standards but I also have 286,000 books for my users to read on mobile apps now. So um, come join us. Thank you.
write my notes in here. Someone else is. Okay, we're gonna need a second. Okay. Do you have your yeah, you need to mm. Oh, I'll go get it. Give me a second. Here. Here we've got history. What was it called? Oh, this is what I'm looking for. Uh is it this one? Stressed you out. That's my bad. Okay. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christy Darby. This is my colleague Lauren Soroka. We are at the Library of Congress. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Jesus. Okay. Um, I'm Christy, this is Lauren, we're at the Library of Congress, um, and we are also going to talk about eBooks today. And we are so excited to go after Nancy, that was amazing, it was such a good lead in. So some background and introduction before we step into the development of the work that we do. Um, the Library of Congress began focusing on digital collecting through, strate or through strategic efforts for several years now. And beginning in 2018, the Digital Content Management section, or DCM, where Lauren and I work, engaged in a number of pilots to investigate methods of file acquisition, management of metadata, processing content, and working towards efficiencies in those processes. And so in support of the library's initiative to provide and expand access to books already in our collection by acquiring the open access ebook version where possible. Uh, our main issue with this though is parts of these workflows are semi-automated, but we have a lot of manual processing. For that and so we could process and make available batches of 20 to 25 books at a time but with the workflows we had we couldn't scale beyond that um, so to routinize this work uh, we began innovating and iterating um, and we were iterating on the works uh, from the earlier pilots that we had done uh, why does it matter uh, acquiring the files provides ac enduring access and preservation for our end users whereas links to open access books on the open web often eventually break and even when content is openly available on the web, of course, there's no guarantee of access in perpetuity. So we chose working with the Director of Open Access Books, we call it DOAB, um, which is a free community-driven, oops, let me see here, sorry, uh, discovery service that indexes and provides access to scholarly, peer-reviewed, open access books. And we chose DOAB because it's a large aggregation of metadata for open access books right now, uh, over 65,000 titles, um, and it's a large content uh, bucket of content for us to work with. Um, also, it provides Creative Commons licenses, which we need um, so we can uh, provide access uh, online. So we set forth uh, with a high-level goal of developing routine workflows for acquiring and making available open access and openly available eBooks. So building on all of the pilots we had done, we were ready to develop more robust workflows and scale this up uh, to process more titles in bulk. So the bulk processing workflow only includes books if the title, if the library already holds the title in print. So this indicates that the Library of Congress has decided to acquire a title, and we depend upon acquisition decisions to determine the processing paths any book will take. To expand our capacity for processing and making eBooks available, we identified major steps we needed to automate. 
Um, so the workflows that we have developed and implemented have helped us grow the open access books collection on lock.gov from 300 books in 2020 to approximately 6,300 books as of last week. So this is the high level workflow that we've created. Um, at each step, we wrote scripts to automate and work in bulk as much as possible. Uh, the five main areas here, identification, ident uh, acquiring files, catalog record creation, digital preservation, and access. Um, and we're gonna talk about each of these in more depth, uh, but before I do, I want to note that this workflow development was highly collaborative with other uh, members of our team and was and continues to be a group effort. So Lauren, if you wanna talk about workflows. Thanks, Christy. Um, so these are some of the tools that we're using to automate our work at various points in the workflow. Um, some of these are tools that a lot of us are using, like OpenRefine and MarkEdit. Um, we're also still working with Voyager, um, which is the library's current ILS. Um, and as a way of working with persistent URLs, we're using um, the handle tool, which is a GUI tool for performing handle operations, like creating and deleting handles. Um, and then there's scripting. So this includes writing Python and Bash scripts, um, managing um, our scripts in Git, um, and pulling data either using Z3950 or APIs. And we're currently using a variety of APIs in our workflow, including for the library's current um, digital content management system, OCLC, Open Library, and Google Books. And um, I'll note here that we do write scripts um, to automate our work, but we are not developers. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about the identification step in the workflow. So first we're exporting um, all the data from DOAB as a CSV. There is other options to export, um, like Mark XML or Onyx or Harvest via OAI PMH, but um, CSV is easiest for us to script against. Um, and then we use OpenRefine and a JSON template we created to remediate some of the data. Um, the DOAB data is a, a little messy because it is an aggregator, so um, we're moving things like new line characters and removing columns because when you do export the DOAB data from um, website, it comes with over 120 columns, um, so we don't need all that data. Um, and then we're doing a first round of analysis to identify some eligible, eligible publishers, just doing some simple filtering, um, which we could probably automate more in the future. Um, so we're flagging inel ineligible publishers. Um, so for example, we can't provide access to um, Australian National University press titles um, before 2018, um, even though they're in DOAB. Um, we're also flagging potential multi-volume works um, and some uh, incomplete titles, like just chapter levels. At this point, we're also extracting ISBNs from the data. Um, they come in at least five different fields in a non-standard way um, in the DOAB data. I don't think so. Oh, it is already full screen. Mm -hmm. um, I think we want to do this. Nope, nope, not that. <laughs> or this will work. I got you. OK, thank mm -hmm. you. That's not it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, and at this stage with identification, we are also executing a series of Python scripts um, that we wrote, and I'm going to talk about each of these in a bit more detail. Um, and the scripts are developed by, um, based on ones by others on our team um, and for other projects and workflows, but we just applied them to this unique situation. 
Um, so first, we wrote a script that searches all of the ISBNs that we found in DOEB um, in OCLC to get the universe of all related ISBNs for a given title. And that could be a lot. Um, and then, uh, and we did all this using the OCLC API. And then we searched all of those ISBNs that we found in the library's catalog using Z3950. Um, and then the script will then split out if the record was for the electronic or the print records according to um, certain mark fields. Um, and then the script then prints the ILS data out to a spreadsheet. And as um, an extra form of validating that we found the right record, we are doing a fuzzy string match um, in the script um, that compares the DOEB title with the title found in the ILS record specifically and the 245. Um, so next, we're identifying if the books already exist in the library's repository, um, coming from other acquisition streams. Most frequently, these are coming from our cataloging and publication program. Um, so for this, we are running a script that will check if the ISBN or the LCCN, which is the Library of Congress control number, um, from the DOEB data in our ILS searches um, is already in our repository. And at this point, if there is any overlap, we're just setting those aside for now um, because those will need to take different workflows. And then next we run a script um, that we wrote that uses all the data we've already gathered to sort the books into various categories. Um, and some of those categories are listed here. Um, but at this stage, we are done identifying those that meet our criteria for bulk cloning and processing. And we worked particularly close with our metadata colleagues um, to, de to determine which print records we could clone based off a variety of um, factors. So in our 2022 review, there were almost 2,700 titles um, that originally fell in this like clone category. So now I'm gonna talk about acquiring and processing file stage of the workflow. So now that we have a subset of content um, that we can work with, uh, we now need to acquire and process the files. So we wrote a script that confirms that the URLs included in the DOAB data um, is valid, that the URLs don't go to zip or EPUB files, or um, that the URL doesn't point to a page with scepter chapter files. And although we can display EPUBs and lock.gov as of a year ago, and we can do some combination with chapters, um, it's just easier to exclude those from now and um, work with a homogenized set of content. If anything, the pandemic taught us how to just be chill when stuff like this happens. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> um. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then we wrote another script to actually download um, the PDFs. Um, and so then once we have all of the PDFs, we need to create thumbnails to display the content in lock.gov. Um, and creating thumbnails for us is a bit of a complicated process. Um, but to do this in bulk, we then, again, wrote another script. Um, so first, we're using the LCCN and ISBNs to search for ebook covers using the Open Library API. And if that's not successful, we use the URL and DOEB data to download the thumbnail from OAPEN, um, which is one of the main content providers in DOEB. Sometimes that uh, correlation between DOEB and OAPEN and is confusing. Um, and if neither of those produce a thumbnail, we will then create um, just a thumbnail from the first page of the PDF. So um, then we are renaming all the files um, by a unique identifiers. And I'll note that the scripts along the way are logging successes and errors. And if there are errors, that's going to require manual intervention. And we're just setting those aside. And at this point, we're doing a bit of thumbnail QA. We're just looking at everything in a grid view, essentially, in Windows Explorer to see if anything stands out rem as remarkably wonky. OK, I'm going to talk about uh, catalog record creation. So in DCM, we don't do any original or copy cataloging, but we can create catalog records by cloning print records and using MarkEdit to create those ebook records. So we use a Python script that we wrote to use LCC and Permalink, which is LC service that provides persistent URLs for bib records in our catalog, to pull the Mark XML for the existing print records that we have previously identified. We worked with Metadata Librarian to develop mark edit task lists that batch transform print records into ebook records. Um, the task lists don't work for everything though, so we also wrote some Python scripts to add record specific data like rights metadata in the Mark 540, uh, handles, and adding LCCNs to records. 
So this graphic, created by our colleague Dave Durden, uh, captures the complexity of the bulk record creation process as it stands now. Um, this complete workflow requires us to convert records five times between and among Mark XML, Mark Binary, and Mark Mnemonic for a total of 26 steps for the cloning process, depending on which tools are being used and what specific record edits we're making. Um, we collaborated with our metadata specialists as well to iterate on this process and make it as automated as possible. So we do, we do have it down, um, I promise. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna talk about the digital preservation stage. Um, so at this stage, we are ingesting our content in the library's homegrown content management system. Um, and because of the scale, we are using um, an API to ingest the content into the system. And when I say ingest, this is really just a series of steps in a workflow that includes inventorying the content, establishing fixity, running malware scan, um, copying the content to long-term um, tape storage and baguette structure, and then to local spinning disk presentation storage. And if along the way we're making any changes to the content, um, that will be logged in our systems. Um, this is actually the easiest and most routine part of the workflow, um, although we're recognizing that working with this, uh, we're working with a challenging and outdated preservation um, and storage system. And then the last stage of the workflow is access. So on a biweekly basis, we ETL or, or extract, transform, and load our content so that it's publicly available um, on lock.gov. Um, this runs on a delta, so this work happens semi-automatically um, every other week. Um, and within our team, we run um, some ETL validation scripts that we wrote to confirm that everything um, that we think is displaying on lock.gov actually is. Um, and at this point, we're also registering handles or persistent URLs, and these handles are on the item page as well as in our catalog records. So all of these ebooks are available in our open access ebooks collection. So end to end, this is um, some internal documentation we have. So this is what the process uh, looks like and kind of gives you a sense of, of the complexity. Um, certainly, we have challenges. Um, DOAB data, as Lauren mentioned earlier, it's inconsistent. Um, the quality varies, but uh, very much based on publisher. Um, Identifiers, so ISBNs are in multiple data fields and sometimes really challenging to match in our catalog. Um, URLs for ebook files, not all URLs in DOAB actually lead to valid pages or valid ebooks, so we have to run link checkers. Um, Creative Commons licenses, some titles are given licenses that are not actually Creative Commons, and we have to make sure that they are Creative Commons licensed in order to get into our uh, open access books collection. Um, as well as maintaining up-to-date metadata for the ebook titles. So um, when we pull data, it becomes outdated, uh, becomes static in spreadsheets, and so timing becomes very important because we're running the risk that the records might be updated in the meantime. Um, encoding uh, is a real challenge. So editing the DOAB CSV in Excel, um, it's challenging because of the scale of the data, special characters, and formatting. Um, we have switched to Open Refine for directly editing data to preserve the special characters um, formatting and UTF-8 encoding. Um, and our current ILS, uh, as Lauren mentioned, we still use Voyager, does not allow for API integration, which means we have to use workarounds to effectively query and pull data from our catalog. So our next steps, um, this workflow, we're continuing to run it annually. The FY23 batch is currently underway. Um, we have a number of technicians who have joined our team, and they are supporting us in manually processing content files for ebooks that are not eligible for this bulk processing workflow. And we have a number of new systems in development, two very important ones, um, including our library collections access platform, call it LCAP, and we're migrating to Folio to replace our current catalog, among new things, or other things, uh, including a new cloud-based digital repository being developed in-house. So the uh, slides are available. This is just a selection of some outreach efforts, some blog posts that we've written, um, and so these links will be available. And our contact information, please contact us. We would love to talk about this process. We love to talk about ebooks. So thanks so much. Keynote, here it is. Got closed. 
Okay. Uh, so I regret uh, that uh, the afternoon code for lib brain is settling in, and you have me between that and relief. Uh, some disclaimers to start with, I am not your lawyer, uh, I am not a lawyer, and if I was a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer, uh, and this is a bit of a litigious area, and I'll get into that at the end of the talk. Um, we're going to talk about controlled digital lending. I believe the legal grounds for CDL are sound and reasonable, but those grounds have not yet been adjudicated in court. Uh, if you embark on a CDL program, be sure to gauge your library's risk tolerance and make choices that are reasonable for your institution. You'll probably want to get your legal counsel involved. Uh, second disclaimer, I'm leaning heavily into a NISO working group's work product, uh, the Interoperable Systems for Controlled Digital Lending Working Group uh, is funded by a grant from the Mellon Foundation to NISO in 2000, uh, tw uh, 2021. Uh, the working group was expected to have a draft for public comment uh, right about now when I propose the talk, uh, but it isn't quite there yet. Uh, so what is controlled digital lending? Uh, in a nutshell, controlled dig digital lending is interlibrary loan or course reserves meets digital rights management. The core idea is that the library is exchanging physical lending uh, with digital lending. Uh, and so CDL has these three key characteristics. Uh, the first is a strict adherence to the number of physically owned copies of a work uh, being never greater than the sum of the simultaneous physical uses and digital uses. However many copies of a book you have physically, that's however many you can lend uh, both digitally and physically. Uh, this is known as the own to loan ratio. Uh, if a physical copy is owned, then that physical copy may be lent either physically or digitally. Uh, so keep this concept in mind, own to loan. Uh, I'll refer to it back several times in the presentation. Uh, the second is controls that limit the access to materials to authorized library patrons. Uh, and the third is user interface elements that limit the potential of unauthorized duplication of the digital surrogates. Uh, this is a fundamental part of the trust relationship between libraries and intellectual property owners. So CDL is grounded in these three points, the, these characteristics that make CDL as close as possible to the physical, legal, and economic conditions that libraries use now to lend items. So if we take a step back and look at the big picture, there are six steps to the CDL workflow. Uh, patron request, uh, establishing loan eligibility, ensuring the own to loan ratio, file management, patron access, and loan tracking. And with each of these components, there's a variety of standards and options that can be used. Uh, the workflow steps are stacked in this diagram, and, and so I'm going to take this apart and we'll look at each one. Uh, first, of course, is the request phase, uh, when the patron tells the library what uh, the patron wants. Uh, this can come from a request button in the discovery layer or catalog, uh, a blank form that the patron enters, or an open URL uh, from another system. Uh, and this would have all the metadata you would expect, uh, details about the item being requested, the context of the patron identity, uh, any special notes about the request, and so forth. When the request comes in, the first thing the CDL system needs to do is determine if the user is eligible to receive the item, and if the item is, itself is eligible to be lent through CDL. Understanding that the user is eligible is pretty straightforward. Uh, are they a valid member of your community, a, a resident or, or a student or, or a staff member? 
looking at the eligibility of the book is where we get our first risk factor. Some libraries, for instance, have decided that books published within a five-year moving wall are not eligible for CDL, that to lend a more recently published item may have an economic impact on the publisher uh, and thus risk being sued. Uh, I believe the Internet Archives CDL program operates uh, with such a restriction. Next, is there a physical copy that be can be sequestered while the digital loan is happening? This is the own to loan ratio. Can the library ensure that there is one user of the item it has purchased? This can take several forms. Perhaps a library treats this like a hold request. They print a, a paging slip, retrieve the item from open stacks, and put it on a shelf in the back room. Or maybe the library has closed stacks, uh, something like a high density storage system and it marks the item as unavailable in the ILS. Uh, maybe a library bought several physical copies and keeps them in a warehouse, so it has a pool of items that can be lent out via CDL. Whatever the library decides its risk tolerance is, this is where it's implemented. Uh, a wait list can also be added to this step in case all of the eligible copies have been loaned out. Next, the library has to have a digital scan of the item uh, to lend out. If the library doesn't have a digital copy, that's a whole workflow on its own. Uh, maybe it scans the item itself. Uh, maybe it gets it from a consortial partner, consortium partner that has already digitized it. Uh, somehow, we'll need to determine if we have the digital copy and have a way to make one if we don't. Uh, we'll probably also want to keep the digital copy once we've made one in case somebody else asks for it again. Uh, but that too, keeping those digital copies around uh, is part of your risk uh, assessment. Now we have something to get into the patron's hands. This is the, the digital equivalent of wanding the barcode and checking the item out to the patron. We may have some sort of digital rights management or DRM that locks this file to this user for a specific period of time. Uh, Adobe Digital Editions is common software uh, that is used for this, uh, although there are other alternatives. It might mean that the user needs some specialized software to read the file. Uh, or the library might opt for an online-only experience, uh, such as a IIIF viewer that has the clipping and downloading functionality removed. Uh, one story uh, during the pandemic, uh, Fordham University whipped up a quick system that uses uh, Google Drive restrictions to allow a specific Google Workspace user to read a PDF file but not print or download it for a specific period of time. Uh, so there are some interesting possibilities here. Uh, finally, we need a way to record the loan uh, and keep statistics showing that the library has kept in compliance with the own to loan ratio. Uh, the patron might also decide to return the item early. Uh, there might also be a notion of a recall uh, for an item that was checked out with an extended due date. Uh, all of these kinds of tracking and item management that libraries do for physical items probably has some equivalent need in a CDL environment. So we have these six workflow steps. Uh, the request, establishing loan eligibility, ensuring the own to loan ratio, getting the digital file, providing that file to the patron, and tracking the loan. As you think about those components or, or systems that mimic those six steps, the kinds of architectures generally fall into four buckets. Uh, the first two are within an institution, um, an institution loading items to that library's own patrons. 
Uh, the second to involve controlled digital lending at a, at a collaborative scale, where the owning library is different uh, from the patron's library. Uh, so let's take each of these in turn and see what the impact is on the six workflow steps. Uh, in this first case, there's a, a standard CDL, standalone CDL system. Uh, it isn't tied to the ILS to determine if there's a physical copy. Uh, instead, the physical copies are pre-sequestered. Uh, they've been pulled out of the collection, digitized, and set aside. This is probably the simplest form of CDL and something that might be found in a uh, course reserve system, uh, a remote storage environment, uh, or a special collections item. The library has already determined that the physical item can be lent uh, through CDL. Uh, in the third step, where we're ensuring the own-to-loan ratio, um, it's just the CDL system ha having a counter of the number of digital items it can loan out uh, and the number of items that digital uh, items that uh, have been lent. We might be using NSIP to determine patron eligibility, or that might come as an attribute from the uh, a campus single sign-on system. Um, so yeah, this is this is the simplest form. Uh, some examples of this kind of model are the our Caltech's DIBS system, D-I-B-S system, uh, some forms of library simplified, uh, file open course reserves, or the Internet Archives open library program. The second model is still within an institution, but in this case, we're adding connections to the ILS. In the third step, we're going to look into the ILS and see if there is a physical copy available that can be digitally lent. If there is, we might print a paging slip uh, to have the item pulled from the shelf, uh, or if it's in remote storage, we might mark it as unavailable. Uh, this probably involves checking out the item from the ILS so that the, the normal checked out or unavailable status appears. Once the system has verified that the physical item is no longer available, the request passes the own to loan ratio step uh, and the physical item, uh, oh, I'm sorry, then the physical item may ne need to be digitized or there might already be a digital file available. This architecture is probably using protocols like NSIP to interact with the ILS for placing holds, uh, checking out items and checking them back in. Examples of this kind of model out in the real world are Ex Libris's uh, Alma Digital Resources product, uh, and the Folio community is talking about developing a CDL app as well. Uh, in the third and fourth models, we bring consortia into the mix. In the third model, we look at the consortium's holdings as a shared pool of physical items. In the second step, the system needs to handle patrons from any library in the consortium as it's deciding on eligibility. In the third step, the system can look across all of the holdings of the consortium to match the loan of a digital item uh, to a patron at library A with a sequestered physical item at library B. As you might imagine, we're increasing the complexity of the system. Uh, is there a shared inventory of physical holdings or are availability lookups done against each library at request time? Are the digital files held centrally or do they remain at the owning library? How does a patron with credentials at library A get access to a digital file stored at library B? This starts to look a lot like interlibrary loan, so what kinds of hooks are needed into ILL management systems like Iliad and uh, Tapasas? In this space, uh, Project ReShare's CDL offering is in development now and it leverages uh, ReShare's shared inventory and returnables app. On the Slack back channel, are people pinging me because my watch keeps... Oh, yes, that's exactly what's happening. No, they're pinging you because you're 
heard you posted something while you were talking and standing away from the Oh, nuts. Well, I, my timing was off by, a, by two slides. Um, in the fourth model, we're well within the land of controlled digital lending as interlibrary loan. I tried to get the acronym CDILL to stick to represent this kind of architecture, but so far I've failed. Controlled digital interlibrary lending. No? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in this architecture, there isn't a CDL system per se, but rather components at different libraries that are using well-defined standards to pass messages about requests and availability and loans. Uh, if you're familiar with the ISO 18626 uh, standard for passing ILL requests between systems at different libraries, just think about those same pathways being used to pass a request to sequester an item or deliver a digital item from a supplying library to a requesting library. You might also consider a scenario where a request is made at one library, a physical copy is sequestered at a second library, and a third library delivers the digital file. So that all probably sounds like fun to technologists like us. Am I, am I right? Is, does this sound like fun? And, but why should we keep this fun to ourselves? Let's get the lawyers involved. As you might imagine, publishers are looking at CDL and saying, you're doing what with my content? The big four publishers, Hachette, HarperCollins, John Wiley and & Sons, and Penguin Random House uh, have sued the Internet Archive over its early pandemic national emergency library. But the lawsuit has turned into an examination of the legal basis of controlled digital lending itself. The Internet Archive asserts that CDL meets the criteria for fair use under United States law. As you might recall, the test for fair use is, uh, uh, has four factors. Uh, one, the purpose and character of the use, uh, the nature of the work, uh, the amount and sustainability of the portion used in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use on the market or potential market for the original work. Uh, the Internet Archive asserts that CDL strongly favors the first, first and fourth factors and is neutral on the second and third. Uh, needless to say, there's a lot of legal theories and precedents being staked out on both sides. Uh, this case was filed in June 2020 and is about to reach an interesting milestone. Uh, both sides have filed a motion for summary judgment, which is a lawyerly way of telling the judge that the facts of the case are so obvious that, of course, the, course, the court needs to decide in their favor. That both sides have filed such a motion means the facts may not be so obvious. But we'll hear what the judge has to say about that on Monday afternoon. So keep your ears open for that. He has scheduled a, a court hearing on Monday afternoon. But it seems like this case may go through a years-long process before there's any kind of ruling. Uh, can you say Google Book Search? Uh, so some more information. These were posted uh, to Slack. I guess I was about four minutes off. Uh, the first is a white paper on controlled digital lending of library books. Uh, this white paper was written by lawyers or lawyer adjacents, uh, so it has 166 footnotes, uh, but it's still a somewhat easy read. Uh, this, no, honest, it's not bad. Um, the second is the CDL implementers group. Uh, this is a, a mailing list and a monthly webinar of libraries and service providers that want to implement CDL functionality. Uh, third, again, if you can't get enough of the law stuff, uh, watch for the documents coming out of the publisher's lawsuit. Uh, this is a link to court listener uh, that mirrors documents that are behind uh, the federal court system paywall. Uh, and if you want to go all the way back to the beginning, then the place to start is uh, Michelle Wu's uh, 2011 paper for the Law Library Journal. Uh, and you can find a copy of that in the Georgetown Law Institutional Repository. 
Um, that's a bit about me, and that is the end. Uh, the uh, uh, presentation notes, the, the links, if you missed them on Slack, are on my blog, and I'll also fill out that, that blog entry with a, a transcript of, of this talk. And thank you. Oh, I quit. No, I didn't. Oh, you don't need the screen at all? I was looking for your notes. Okay. All right, I have a few quick announcements and then it's time to go. Uh, poster presenters, uh, please collect your poster before you leave if you want them. They will not be kept overnight. Uh, have you enjoyed the conference experience? Yay! Let's make it sure it happens again next year. We're looking for a host for 2024. If you're curious about hosting and would like more information about this amazing opportunity, be sure to join us at the uh, C4L24 breakouts tomorrow. And game night tonight. Uh, do you play games? Come join your fellow code flippers in a, a few card or board games uh, tonight. Uh, game night will take place uh, tonight from 7 to 11 p.m. And here in the Frisk Campus Center on the A floor seating area that we keep walking through all the time. Uh, outside food and drinks are allowed. And the, oh, I did need a screen. Well, the community support volunteers uh, tonight for game night are uh, Su Jong Herring and Esme Coles. Um, and I want to do a shout out to Vin Stanley, Dan Kuyu. Jake Brown, Alex Brownstein, and the rest of the broadcast crew here at Princeton. We are so grateful for all the work that they are doing up at the broadcasting booth to keep things running. <laughs> if you're giving a lightning talk tomorrow morning, please visit the podium between 8 and 8.45 a.m. to load your presentation onto the computer. And please don't forget your badge and lanyard tomorrow morning. Put it somewhere handy tonight so you don't forget uh, to grab it on your way out the door in the morning. It's your ticket in. Yeah. And you made it. Even if you're not serious about hosting a conference, thank you. Show up.